So I'm going to talk about the open uh, storage network. This is a little bit further down the stack from uh, Dataverse and, and our space, uh, but an important part of the mix. Uh, so I'll come back to this, this later, but our, uh, you can think of the open storage network as uh, a national resource uh, for sharing uh, open si active uh, open science data uh, with the interesting characteristic that it is distributed infrastructure as opposed to one giant store in, in one giant place uh, and also uh, governed in a distributed way. So not one single entity uh, is, is operating it. So it's maybe closer to the internet than, than, uh, than a, a big Ceph storage stack. Um, if you think about the motivation uh, for this, then you've heard this all before, the, the godfather of the OSN is Alex Zelay. He's an astrophysicist, um, also a, a, a computer guy. He and Jim Gray wrote the, um, the Sloan Digital Archi Archive a, a, a while back. Uh, but he was noticing, uh, there are actually several Moore's Law effects going on on, on this slide. He was noticing that the uh, photo arrays on the backsides of telescopes were, were growing at, at Moore's Law rates and were soon about to, to overwhelm the world. Uh, you see the same thing going on in sequencing. You see it going on in brain imaging. Uh, at the LHC, uh, Peter said that, you know, scientists never throw data away. In order to keep the data down to terabytes a day, uh, the LHC, LHC actually throws away all but one in 10 million events. Uh, they measure, measure their event streams in femtobarns, which you can look up on, on Wikipedia. It's a really big number. Uh, so we are being deluged by data from many different sources. And we're in an interesting place. Uh, this is a comment about, uh, and particularly the NSF science ecosystem, but I think it's, it's maybe true uh, in, in other places as well. Uh, for a long time, we've been working on, on computation, right? Ever, ever since John von Neumann kidnapped the, the ENIAC and took it to Los Alamos. Uh, networking, you know, there are hundreds of universities now networked at very high speeds. It's, it's actually pretty straightforward to get maybe eight, eight nine, ten gigabits of, per second of data from one place to another. It's quite, quite extraordinary. Storage, on the other hand, uh, is largely balkanized, mostly on campus uh, storage arrays. Uh, the good thing about standards and storage is there are many to choose from, right? Uh, but, but needs a little bit of unification. Uh, so that's where we're trying to head. Again, what we're doing is national resource for sharing open scientific uh, data in a way that the governance and operation is distributed as opposed to concentrated uh, in one place. Uh, we're doing a pilot right now with six sites. A couple of them were founded a long time ago by the Schmidt Foundation. Um, uh, the next wave of sites were founded, uh, funded by the, uh, uh, by the NSF. Um, and you can just see on the map uh, where they are. Uh, part of the point of this was to uh, to spread them far enough across the country that you couldn't cheat, right? Uh, this really had to be a distributed uh, kind, of, kind of infrastructure. Um, if I go forward rather than back, uh, just one example. This is, this is actually a, uh, working with a project uh, that, that our connection is Chris Hill at MIT. He may still be in the audience. Um, uh, but the idea here is we are, you know, the, the geoscience community is now capable of generating uh, uh, simulated synthetic data that's pretty close to the real thing for really interesting sizes of ocean. So when you model the Straits of Malacca now, uh, you can generate data that looks statistically a lot like the real Straits of, the, uh, of Malacca, which gives you an enormous amount of, excuse me, uh, 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 an enormous amount of flexibility in looking at different kinds of oceanographic events. Uh, the results from these simulations are massive uh, from a data point of view, uh, so sharing them is, is quite challenging. Um, uh, this shows uh, uh, Chris's uh, computer engaging or, or uh, uh, engaging one where he does these simulations uh, and movement of data between the Northeast Storage Exchange uh, the MGHPCC node uh, on the OSN, uh, and also um, exchanging data with the Scripps Institute um, out near SDSC, where there's another uh, uh, another node. So uh, S3 from engaging one to uh, uh, to the MGHPCC node, uh, we can drop it down using Globus uh, to uh, to the Northeast Storage Exchange, but we can then also uh, transfer it quickly and efficiently across the country. 
again, at many gigabits per second, um, headed down to scripts. And I think the, the principal point of this is it's mostly invisible and mostly fast. Um, uh, so you don't have to worry uh, from a science point of view about where your data is and, and where you want to get it to. Um, just to give you a sense for some of the other folks that are uh, dropping data onto the open storage network uh, uh, today, uh, critical zone observatories, enormous amounts of data about uh, kind of the physical and chemical properties of the surface of the Earth. Um, Pangeo, which is not on the list, is a very large climate uh, database. Um, there are machine learning databases that are on their way in, uh, telescopes, um, uh, and, and so forth. So there's a wide variety of projects where when you come to them, uh, very often their data is bottled up right, in their institutional repositories. Uh, if you're a large institution, that's less of an issue because you can kind of afford the bandwidth and the, and the management, but if you're a midsize or a small institution uh, or a distributed project, uh, it's a lot tougher to, uh, to get the data out uh, into the world in a fast and convenient way. Um, getting to data sets stored in the OSN um, is really a multifaceted affair. I think what we found uh, is that the emergence of S3 as kind of a base standard uh, gives people something to hook up to uh, that makes it easy for you to either just do raw, raw S3, and that's uh, what, what at least several of the in initial folks are, are doing, uh, but you can also overlay it on it, uh, things like our clone, uh, IRODs uh, from, uh, uh, from Rinse, uh, Globus, Clouder, CyberDuck, uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, and, and we've had conversations with some folks in this room as well about experimental overlays that, that do, for example, um, better ways of unifying the namespace uh, or just moving data or caching data so it's not only a platform delivering scientific data, but it's open and flexible enough uh, to try, try some experiments uh, as, as well. Um, how we deploy, uh, we didn't read Hugh's memo about how it's impossible to deploy systems, so we went ahead and did it. Um, uh, I'll, I'll say that the way we did it was we locked Jim Colbert up in his coding cage, fed him steaks for a couple of weeks, uh, and emerged with something that, you know, if you look back down the mountain of where we've come, as opposed to up the mountain uh, uh, to, to the places that we need to go for management of large systems, it's actually pretty amazing, right? Uh, so you start with your Ansible scripts uh, locked away in your GitHub repository. Uh, there's a, a command center, a provisioning node, right, that, that grabs them. And when you want to stand up an, a, a new pod, uh, they link up, provision the monitor nodes, provision the data nodes. So the, I should have mentioned these are all, you know, uh, multi-petabyte Ceph appliances, um, thanks to Ceph Ansible and, and, and that crew. Uh, and it's, I'm being deliberately glib here, but at some level, you press the button and you go. Um, we've tested this by, you know, burning down the software uh, and seeing how it goes, and mainly the, the, the startup time is, is how long it takes to spin up the disks. Uh, the other component to this is, is monitoring. So we've got monitoring nodes in, in I think, three places, uh, actually two places uh, at either end of the country. Uh, those are uh, watching, you know, for, for events, uh, both logging, doing the normal things that you do. And, but when you publish, um, so at Harvard, when you publish, you go to us, uh, you publish an event, it goes to a Slack channel inside of the Harvard Research Computing Group. Uh, in our case, uh, the events go to a Slack channel that uh, is embedded uh, in, in maybe six or seven uh, different research computing, uh, computing groups with a protocol for figuring out how to, how, how to respond in reasonable time. So again, I'm being deliberately glib here. There's a lot more to do, uh, but it's, it's remarkable what you can do with a cooperative effort, uh, distributed, uh, uh, distributed operations and, and distributed development with the tools that the open source community uh, has brought to, uh, allowed us to bring to bear. So just one more thought, I might even be earlier, somebody's waving a sign at me. Um, uh, active data sets are welcome within reason. Uh, we're, we're loading the network up now. Uh, and new sites are welcome also. Um, uh, we are, we have a recipe, recipe for dropping in a pod. It may be at some point, it's more of a protocol-based thing for existing equipment, but right now we're, we're dropping appliances. 
uh, and and uh, would love to have you join the team.